Hello and welcome to another knitting pod. I am Lena and I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. Um, it is October 13th. It's been a second since we hung out and I am very much looking forward to sitting down with you guys and having a proper catch up about knitting and life and everything else. Um, thank you for being here. If you are a returning viewer, thank you for being patient. I feel like I've been a little bit um, irregular posting the last month or six weeks. Um, I'll talk about that at the end of the podcast a little more if you want to stick around for that. Um, but let's just get started. But before we do get started, there's no way I could come to you today without addressing in some manner the horrors that are happening in Israel right now. Um, it has truly felt surreal to me that we find ourselves in this state that the world is in right now. It's just, I am 100% positive you all feel the same way because it's, it's too much to wrap your brain around. Um, wherever you are in the world, I send you strength and love to endure just witnessing it. And to those of you with any sort of family in Israel or anywhere in that region, there are no words. I, I truly am without words to offer anything. Um, I think to me, there's this constant feeling of gratitude accompanied with guilt just, you know, it's like I said, it's mid-October and this is one of my favorite seasons and the colors are changing and it's so, so beautiful. And every time I'm driving or walking and appreciating the beauty of the trees, I just am filled with gratitude to witness it and guilt that my life is peaceful enough to pause and observe anything when there are so many people in this world that are right now living in terror and in a war zone, I just, there are no words. So if you feel the same way, uh, that gratitude tinged with so much guilt always, um, I, I wish there was a way forward that made us feel useful. You know, I think the helplessness makes everything worse. Um, I can do nothing but pray that the world finds more leaders that are here to make lives better for the people they are saying they're leading rather than just, you know, leading with just the desire for more power, which sometimes it feels like there's too much of that these days. But anyway, all I can do is offer you an hour or so where we can be together and talk about the things we love. And um, if it's a little respite for you from the craziness of the world, then um, that would make me happy. So let's make the uncomfortable transition to all the regular things we talk about here. Um, it does feel like there is just a cloud over everything right now. But I have two FOs to show you. Today, um, I finished the Kutar hat by Sari Nordland. Um, it is this beautiful beret um, made out of lace. I decided not to block it out as a beret. I think a lot of people block these kinds of hats by putting a plate so that you flatten the top while it blocks and it kind of shapes it out. For me, apparently I have a tiny pin head, so my head, hats tend to always be too loose for me. So I had already reduced down the ribbing more than she recommended. Um, and I was worried that if I put a plate in here that was big enough to make this part flat, that it was gonna stretch out the brim. So I did not do that. Um, I just left it as kind of a slouchy hat and I, 
love it. Before I try it on for you guys, I will tell you I did choose to do the I-Cord bind off, which I think is so beautiful for this hat. I've never done a hat with an I-Cord bind off, so I was very concerned that I was going to make it too tight and that it was going to be uncomfortable on my forehead. So as I was making it, it started to really look to me like it was going to be too small. So what I did, stupidly, do not do this. Um, I bound off most of it with the I-cord and then I did Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off on just the back part so that I, I felt like it would have more give. It was a terrible idea. <laughs> so then I had to, you know, put those bound off needle uh, stitches back on my needle which isn't super smooth or easy. And then I finished it with a bind off. So is the bind off completely like seamless and smooth? It is not, but if you have watched my previous episodes, you know that I am not particularly bothered by imperfections in my knitting. Um, if I were, I would probably not knit because we're human and we're always making mistakes. And even when you try to correct mistakes, sometimes they don't correct perfectly. So I'm going to put this on and it's going to end poorly for my hair. But, um, so it's, you can kind of see it's like, because of the beret, it has like extra slouchiness up here. And I actually made, um, the ribbing a lot longer because I really wanted it to be able to come down over my ears. Since I live in a cold climate and we're getting to cold days, I just, I, uh, I wanted it to be, I felt like I would wear it more when it was more like a slouchy hat than a beret. Um, and I think I'm right. I, I guess if it was a beret, this part would be flat like this, which is super cute too, but I think I'm a little, I would be a tiny bit self-conscious if it was like a full on beret. And this just, this just makes me so happy. I think it's beautiful. I'm, I'm trying to give you a side view, but I can't see what I'm showing you. So um, it's just, you know, with lace like this, you can see it a lot better when it is stretched out on someone's head. But I give this pattern a literal 10 out of 10 maybe even 12 out of 10. It is gorgeous. It is engaging in like just the right amount. I'm just, I'm obsessed, absolutely obsessed with this hat. I think it's beautiful. I used a single, um, uh, La Bienname singles in the colorway Jinju, held double with a strand of Shibui Silk Cloud in the colorway, I don't know, I don't remember. I found the label the other day and I was like, ooh, that's a fun name and I forgot about it. But I do absolutely um, love the way that that halo um, happens when you hold a strand of mohair, especially with a hat because I think when you're standing and wearing this, it like gives your head a glow. Like it's kind of magical. So new favorite hat, absolutely thrilled with it. Um, sorry, I'm gonna have a crazy head, but I did want to show you guys how it looked on. Like I said, I couldn't recommend it more. I love Sari Nordland. I think she is brilliant and um, I have only knit hats by her. I don't know why. I'm always like drawn to her hats. Sorry, my hair looks crazy now. The other, so that's that. I have one more thing to show you is, do y'all remember this hat, the Harlow hat by Andrea Mowry? I showed you guys two months ago, maybe. I think I've been knit it in, yeah, it was in August because I remember being in the mountains. I found this incredible pom-pom and I had to show you because when I did a little episode about this hat, it was a, should I add a pom-pom, should I not? And while my hair is messed up, let's just do this. Let's just do this, y'all. The pom-pom adds everything. Now, two hats could not be more different. Um, this hat is like 
elegant lace in this beautiful latte color. And this is insane neon yellow with a marled black and white yarn, but man, I love them both. This hat went from like a maybe okay to like knocked it out of the park with this incredible pom-pom. I found this at my local yarn shop of which I have many, but my most local, which is like walking distance, Maverick Fiber Arts, um, I just couldn't believe I found this pom-pom. Now, it is a big one because if you're going to go for it, go for it, right? But I do think it kind of like moves. I don't, I wish it, I could make it a little more snug and I'm sure there's a way to. I just literally attached this pom-pom yesterday just so I could show you guys, but I love this hat. Also, so my hat wardrobe is refreshed, mine and my daughter's, because I know she's going to steal this hat, which is totally fine. But it's finally getting to be cold here, and I couldn't be happier. Summer ranks as my lowest season. I love fall because, like I said earlier, the colors are just absolutely mind-blowing in the trees here, and... Um, just the thought of winter coming, it's just, it makes me so happy. It's my favorite season. Um, it's my favorite time of year from, you know, mid-September through the end of December. And now there's snow on the mountains here and it just, oh, makes me so happy. So anyway, the, this is the Harlow hat. If I didn't already tell you by Andrea Maury, this is, um, I've held, Hedgehog fibers in their sock yarn. The yellow is the colorway wild card. I've held it double. And then this black and white marled yarn is um, wool folk in their snow base. Yes. And this is zero plus one is the colorway. Um, and it is reversible. But now that I've done the pom-pom, I picked my favorite side. And this was it. So anyway. That is all I have for you in terms of um, finished objects. But um, what else? Okay, so um, <laughs> I've been so looking forward to the MCAL. For those of you um, who are previous viewers, you know I absolutely adore Stephen West and for the last like six weeks, I feel like I've been trying really hard to clear and work through projects on the needles in anticipation of the MCAL. And um, my friend Jessica was gonna join in for the first time. And we had the most spectacular day. We The day it came out, she came over and we cast on together. And we just had truly one of the best days. It was just magic. We sat on the patio. We enjoyed the fall weather. We had gotten pastries and coffee, and we just had a great day casting on. And, you know, then in the afternoon, just slowly started seeing kind of some uh, feedback on clue one of the mystery knit along. That was kind of, some people were seeing, um, offensive symbols, hate symbols. Um, other, people's, other people didn't, but it just started to kind of become kind of a kick up. And it just, it kind of became a little too much for me to handle. And I just, I decided to just put my work in progress, my MCAL to the side. Um, I think because I truly, truly adore Stephen West. It felt just like truly like pained on his behalf because I can't imagine a human being that is more just like his goodness and kindness. It's, it just exudes from him. And to, I can only imagine how he was feeling through all that. And it just, oh, I just felt, I felt it just was too much. I myself was struggling with my own stuff at that moment. And I just was like, I'm gonna put it aside. 
And then the very next day, the you know horrors unfolded in Israel. And it just truly, I just had to put it aside. I had to just take a break. And I feel like we all have to, I don't know, respect our own emotions and our own journey through all these kind of weird moments. And for those of you who are continuing on, like I'm so thrilled to see so many people able to move on and like participate and support him because, oh, there's no one, I'm not being very eloquent, but to me, there's no one that like, is less capable of hurting people than Stephen West. And like, I just, my hope is that this whole thing fades into the background and then the next three weeks, it's just a distant memory and he is left feeling the joy of the project he brought to everybody and everybody making it feels the same joy. So that is my update on the MCAL. Do I feel pressure to pick it up and do it? because of how much I love him, yes. But I also have to kind of listen to my own voice internally with my own personal chaos in this moment, if that makes any sense. I, again, I'm really sorry. I don't feel like I'm able to communicate properly what I feel about this whole thing. and. I am not saying anyone is right or wrong. I'm gonna make that really clear. If you if you felt that you saw that, then I know like you feel like you saw that. And that's like, there's no right or wrong side of this issue. I just hate that we still live in a world clearly where these things are even, anyway, we're not going back there. But that is my update about the MCAL. I'm gonna move on because I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to communicate that any clearer. Um, so what have I been knitting? Let's move on to that. Um, well, a couple weeks ago, maybe I was telling you guys that I was having a lot of trouble starting the heirloom quilt cardigan, um, which if you don't know this pattern, it's by Katrin Seberger, I believe. It's this incredible cardigan that is built out of individually made squares that are meant to look like quilting squares. I had liked this pattern a lot, but I said last time when I talked about it, she did like a little video on her Instagram showing herself styling it in the fall. And the minute I saw that, I was just like, I had to make it. It was just like this extreme necessity that I make it. And I really didn't think one thing about it, it doesn't look complicated in terms of color work. I was just like, color work flat, how hard could that be? Well, it turns out I really, really struggled with it. I struggled and struggled and struggled and got very, very frustrated. Um, and I just decided again to put that aside, which this is all the stew of, you know, my knitting funk that I've been in. Um, so a while went by and then I just felt like, okay, I'm going to pick it up again. However, the difference was the first time I picked it up, I had been trying to do everything right. Okay. And I think knitters understand what I'm saying. Like there are, especially like, let's just take color work since this is color work. There is a lot of information, lots of YouTube tutorials out there on the correct way to do it that you have to hold your yarn in a way that you're conscious of yarn, of color dominance. You have to catch your floats in a certain way, every certain number of stitches. These feel almost like they become mandates, like this is the right way to do it. And maybe it's the absolute rule follower in me that's like, I think I need, if I'm gonna do something, I need to be doing it correctly. And knitting, I think it's, it doesn't serve like it's great that there's so many tutorials out there but sometimes when they become very much like this is the right way to do it and don't do it any other way i internalize a lot of pressure and i think that's what was happening to me with the color work flat when i was first doing it i kept trying to 
go to this tutorial and that tutorial, like hoping something would click and make it easy to do it perfectly. Whereas once I let it sit for a while and I was like, what if I just make a blog and it's imperfect, but I'm just doing it the way I feel like fumbling my way through it without trying to follow any of these rules. And that was like literally the most freeing thing ever for me. Like it literally, it kind of gave me a completely new perspective on knitting generally that like what are hard and fast rules, they're really not. Cause you know what? It's just knitting. Like it means everything to me knitting, but like whether some renowned knitting teacher would find my knitting perfect is really not, it is absolutely not like the aim for my knitting to be perfect. So long story short, again, I'm dragging on and on, but I decided to fumble my way through a block and I just, then it actually came out and then I fumbled my way through a second block just using scrap yarn just because I wanted to work it out for myself. And I honestly figured out that you don't have to catch every float, every five stitches. You don't have to think about color dominance, honestly. Like I will show you the blocks I've made. I have not thought about color dominance. Now, there are some patterns where it's a different type of color work pattern, like more traditional fair isle looking where maybe it does matter and maybe it matters to people who have more of a perfectionist eye than I do. I do not see it in my knitting in this particular project. So I just let the, um, let the color dominance thing go. I stopped worrying about how graceful my knitting was. Like, was I holding the yarn one in each hand or one in, no. What I've been doing now is literally, I don't usually knit color work this way, but I have just been dropping the yarn and picking up the other strand. And when I do want to catch a float because the things are long, I literally just twist my yarn and the balls. And honestly, it's almost comical how fluid I've become in my own procedure. And because you're making the same block over and over, you really do start to master your way of knitting this particular project. So without going on and on even more, why don't I just show you the blocks I have? Okay. This is almost comical to me, but I was blocking the ones I made and I pinned them out like this. And then I thought, this is kind of an amazing way to show you guys. So excuse the fact that I'm a huge nerd. I'm gonna scoot over a little. These are the blocks that I have made so far. Um, I am using Rowan Felted Tweed. Um, and you can see kind of my colors my color theme coming through here. I am so happy with them. Like Andrea Mowry always says, um, you know, like nobody's coming to look at your knitting like is super up close. And I just couldn't agree more. Like if I zoomed in super close with those squares, you would see the tension is not perfect. I'm sure there's 101 flaws, but nobody's looking at it like that. Like they're look, if they're that close to you, they need to back up y'all. Um, like, but from here, I just, I think they look so beautiful and I'm so fully obsessed with this project. You guys, I wish I could explain how obsessed I am with this project. There are just no words. And if you've been watching my podcast, then you know that I truly was suffering from a knitting funk like of a proportion I have never had before. And it was very, it was like, it affects me in my life because knitting is like my constant companion, my love, my comfort, my joy. Like when I'm happy, I knit. When I'm sad, I knit. When I'm bored, I knit. When I'm, you know, in the stands I knit. I knit all the time, every five minutes I can get. So when my knitting mojo is off, it really affects my life. This project has given me my knitting mojo back and I will be forever grateful because it's just like when you're in that flow with the right project, it just sparkles, literally life sparkles. 
So to me, it's like this project has been an absolute harmony of yarn, pattern, knitting needle, colors, season of the year, everything. It's like, it's just like the perfect, all the pieces are fitting together right now. I am using my very um, rarely used Luca um, needles that I, I don't know, are these bamboo or something? They're wooden or wooden-ish. This is the square I have currently on. Um, like I said, it's Rowan felted tweed. My darling friend Jessica, when I told her that was the yarn I was using, she was like, oh my God, it's the best yarn ever. I have some balls. I'll bring it to you so that you can um, try it out before your shipment arrives. And absolutely fell in love with this yarn. She is 1000% correct. It is glorious. Um, I have gotten a bunch of, I really wanted, to me, this cardigan screams like a vintage. Um, so the colors I wanted to be, I wanted to use color because I've been using so many muted um, natural shades lately, but I wanted them to be colors that were like very earthy and natural feeling. And I literally went to my favorite yarn um, webs of this, my online store that I love is Woolen Company. I absolutely love them. And I know some of you live near that actual, you know, store and I'm so jealous. So I went on there instantly when I saw this yarn, I was like, I've never used it, but I thought it looked, it had that vibe exactly what I wanted because it has that tweediness. Obviously it's called felted tweed. It has a bit of a halo from the alpaca. It just has such a, the, the feel and the look was exactly what I was going for. And then once I clicked on it, the colors are just so spot on. So I literally just filled my cart with the colors that just drew me in. And then when I went to look at the cart so I could see all the colors together, I thought they were just, they sung. It was like perfection. So I just literally didn't even think about it for one second longer. Then I clicked buy. Um, let me tell you real quick the colors. This is cinnamon. Um, this is barn red, I think. This is peach, which to me is ominously more like a coral strawberry color, but it's called peach. This is French mustard, which, oh my God, I love that name. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites. This is sulfur. I think these two... Like if you look at this block, I did these two together, this block, and I just absolutely love this color combination together. It's my absolute favorite um, because it's just, this is reminding me of certain trees. I don't, I wish I knew what the trees were, but in the fall, their, their foliage turns this bright limey green before they, you know, flutter to the ground. And it's just... This whole palette, like I said, it just, to me, encapsulates fall. And um, let's see, what else? Jessica, the ones she brought me um, were kind of older, like the older balls. So I don't know what these colors are called. Um, I think this one might be called Lime. I think this is called Seafarer because I saw it on, um, on Wool & Company. And then this is Stone. Um, I think I'm going to do the sleeves in two different colors like she has in the sample because I think it looks so cool. It gives it that quilty vibe even more. And I think I'm going to do one sleeve in stone and one sleeve in cinnamon and maybe do cinnamon for the, all the ribbing. I don't, I don't know. It's going to be a minute, y'all. It is a large project. Um, this is sold as being DK, but to me it is a lot... It is a heavy, to me, feels more like a heavy, heavier sport, light DK. So the, there's three sizes. There's a lot of built-in ease. The smallest size is 50 inches in circumference. And I thought that would be perfect. But when I made the block that corresponds to size one, look how tiny it is. Um, this is not wet blocked or anything. So it looks really bad. But... Um, 
this was too tiny so i actually am making the size two and like you can see the difference um it's absurd how small that one is so the blocks are about six inches by seven inches i think um and i you know as you as you make them you can start messing with the, uh the layout for the back and it's just a joyful project you guys like i don't know if you remember a couple of months ago, I was super obsessed with the half and half triangles wrap really late on that bandwagon. But I think um, one of the things I was telling you guys about that I loved about that project was just the volume of colors that Linen Quill comes in and like playing with those color combinations is just, there's something really magical about just playing with the colors, two colors, like seeing the play between just two colors. Like when we get into lots of colors, it's kind of a riotous play, but like the play between two solid colors, there's something really cool about kind of dabbling in that, which is what I was like so obsessed with making potential color combinations for the half and half triangles wrap. Well, this to me is like the perfect version of that because the tri half and half triangles wrap is enormous. I mean, it is an endeavor. You are using six, like something like six skeins, five to six skeins of fingering weight yarn. I mean, that is an insane amount of yarn to knit, to watch color play. But this, I mean, it's like exactly that same magic in a bite size. So like laying out all my yarn and deciding what the next color combination I'm gonna make is just, is pure joy. It is so much fun. If you have had even a single thought to knit this project, again, 10 out of 10 so far. Like the struggle I had at the beginning, it was so worth pushing through because now it's completely like the perfect Goldilocks project for me where there's an ease, but there's still like an attention I have to give it. And that to me is the sweet spot between not struggling too much and not being totally mindless, like a stockinette sweater or something. So again, I think it's, it's just, it is too much fun. Um, uh, what else did I want to say about it? Um, you know, I, I think when we, sometimes we're drawn to something and we can get so frustrated. Like for instance, the look of brioche, right? The brioche knitting is so stunning, but sometimes at the beginning, you're just struggling, struggling, struggling. And you're like, oh, like I wanted it to be joyful. I really want to make it to the other side. And sometimes when you feel that, just push through the discomfort. It is worth pushing through, learning the new thing because once it clicks, it's just, a, it's a good feeling. So I'm very happy to say the heirloom cardigan, heirloom quilt cardigan is clicking in the way that I had hoped and dreamed. And many of you had um, brought to my attention that there's uh, an online class that one of the yarn shops in the Northeast is doing for this class. And I think that is an awesome resource if you are struggling. Um, I will put a link to that class in the show notes so that if you have any interest, you can join. I know it was gonna be on Zoom or Facebook or something and the um, instruction, the videos were gonna be, I think, um, recorded so you can reference them as you go, I believe. So great resource if you wanna do it. Um, I will, this will be a work, this will be a yarn I turned to over and over again. Um, I wanted to say that before we turned away from this project because it is so soft. It is a wool alpaca blend with some viscose, I believe, because, um, which gives it, you know, a little more toughness, but it's soft. It's the color range is beautiful. Like I said, the colors are very natural. It doesn't have that super wash color look. I, am obsessed and I've never worked with Rowan yarns before because I tend to just find yarns that are in my yarn shops and I have never seen Rowan and what a shame 
They have so many spectacular yarns. Their website is quite lovely. You should go check it out. They also make this in an Aran weight. And as light as this DK is, I'm thinking the Aran might actually be more like a worsted. Um, they make some really cool um, fluffy yarns that reminded me somewhat of uh, Melted Baby Surrey Alpaca by Ching Fiber that a lot of us just love, but is not as accessible here in the States. Um, so well worth checking out Rowan and their extensive line of yarns. Um, I couldn't be happier. And my friend Jessica said they wear really, really well, that she's knit full sweaters and worn them a lot and it wears beautifully. So, cause to me, a beautiful fiber that pills is not a beautiful fiber. Like that is not a fiber I want to work with. So I hope this doesn't pill, but I'm seeing no evidence that it does. So anyway, all right, y'all. I think that might be all the knitting content I have. Um, I'm trying to think before I move on, if was there anything I needed to say about my beautiful heirloom quote cardigan? I know a couple of you are also going to make it and I just, I can't wait. I can't wait to see more of this project everywhere. It's like one of those incredible projects that I think is gonna catch fire in the knitting community um, with very good reason. Do I think the pattern could have been a little more robust in terms of just guidance? Absolutely. Um, but I think the more that people knit it, uh, maybe that guidance will start coming out just in various places. If you guys have any questions for me about how I specifically did it, I'm not promising that I have some artful, beautiful, elegant way to knit this, but I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about it. So anyway, um, if, you are only here for the knitting content. I am at the end of my knitting content for today. Um, I've been so obsessively knitting this that there hasn't been a whole lot of pull for me um, in any other direction. Um, I will wrap up by talking about life and all the craziness of that. So if you do not want to hear about that, I hope to see you next time. Um, if you are new here, please do subscribe. I would love to have you more often. Um, anyway, moving on away from knitting proper, I do want to just tell you guys, like, it's, it was kind of like, wasn't sure if it was something I wanted to talk about here or not, but I decided to share because I like to share with you guys and I felt like it would be, um, what's the not transparent of me if I wasn't sharing like what has been going on in my head for the last month or so because I haven't I haven't taped as much as I normally do and I think you some of you probably noticed that um anyway I I don't even know it's so hard to talk about random stuff like this but forgive me if I'm not eloquent but I was really struggling just with being on YouTube generally. I I wanted to do this podcast for a really long time before I finally started doing it. And before I, the hesitation always was just the extreme vulnerability of putting yourself out there and not knowing what kind of reception you will get, whether you will just have complete crickets, complete radio silence or negative feedback or what. It's just, it's really hard to put yourself out there. Especially for me, I have never been a social media person. I just don't really love it. And it just, it felt like a huge leap. And I finally got brave enough to do it and promised myself I would do it for a year and give it a year and then decide then if I wanted to continue on. And I was truly, truly blown away because I have zero presence on social media or in the knitting community that even one person watched it, let alone that I was consistently for the last, whatever, nine months or whatever that I've been doing this, 
consistently getting new subscribers and feedback and a wonderful group of people that seemed really engaged and positive and it was just shocking to me and I was just thrilled and then um, it was just beyond my wildest expectations and then like right in mid-August it was literally like maybe mid-August early September it felt like just a water tap had been turned off and like I felt like my channel came to a complete standstill and suddenly there just seemed to be it just seemed to be very quiet like there was just that flow of consistent new subscribers had just stopped and at first it didn't bother me and then slowly it just started bothering me so much I cannot tell you how like how much turmoil I felt like it was causing me internally. It was just what I felt. I can't speak for anybody else in the that's putting things out there, but it felt it feels very personal because it is it's I don't come on, on here and just tell you guys about yarn and knitting and patterns. I tell you truly of from the heart so much about myself and my thoughts and my feelings and so it's a very vulnerable thing and I think very sensitive to feeling rejection and I think on the internet unlike in person like if you went to a dinner party and there was like awkward stilted conversation I would not come away from that particularly beating myself up because I think when we have in-person interactions we can like read other people and kind of intuit whatever the reality that is happening. But on the internet, it's just you. And then behind that screen, you have no idea who's on the other side. And your brain or my brain, I'm just going to talk about the way I do this, is my brain interprets anything that I don't know in a completely negative way. Like, internalizing it, personalizing it. There's something wrong with me. I'm doing something wrong. I'm taking it as an absolute personal rejection. When in reality, what mediates this is an algorithm that I have no idea about and no control over if that algorithm is going to recommend my podcast to somebody or I have no idea how any of this works. Okay. I am not an internet person. I don't, I just don't know. So rather than seeing it as something I don't know, I'm just like interpreting everything negatively. Anyway, again, I'm rambling, but it just became to the point where I was like, I don't feel like it's worth the like personalizing the pain and the feeling of personal rejection. It's not worth me doing this if that's the price, if I am linking my success to this number that I'm seeing, it's just going to kill me. It's going to, it was turning me into wanting to fit whatever mold I thought people wanted for me. And that is not what I'm here for. I am here for truly showing up in the most authentic way I can and share in the realest way I can and numbers be damned and it took me a lot of work to finally get to that point where now I can see that my success needs to be measured by my efforts and my living up to my expectations of myself and not by some external metric um, of what might be perceived as success. I don't know. I don't know if any of that is making sense, but the reason I wanted to tell you all that, aside from explaining my absence, is that I think what I've realized through this struggle I've gone through over the last month, and it, I have to say, it sounds absurd, right? It sounds so petty, but I think any creative endeavor, and to me, this space is a very, creative endeavor, a big creative endeavor, 
is very vulnerable to rejection. Like if you're a knitwear designer, when you release a pattern and you don't get the uh, reception you want, I don't anticipate that feels that's very difficult to process or authors or music makers, any of that. It's just so vulnerable to be creative. But it's not just in a creative space. I think we all have this feeling that if we can just get to the right number, whether it's the right weight, or if we're just pretty enough, or if we're just rich enough, or if we have the right car, or the right house, or the right look, or our kids act a certain way, that there's this certain threshold where we will finally feel good enough, that we will finally feel truly validated, and we will finally stop doubting ourselves and doubting what we're doing and whether we're doing it right. Or I feel like we're all in that space, whether it's a creative space or if it's just life. And it made me realize that anytime we're looking outwards for validation, we are never going to have enough. It will never be enough that we have to set our own metrics, get off the ladder of comparison altogether. Like I was caught up in this feeling of there's so many more successful podcasters and then I need to be more like them because clearly what I'm doing doesn't have that connection. But no, I just like me imitating someone else's work is absolutely not going to succeed and even if it did that's not how that's not how I want to function in this world I want to be the best me and not the best imitation of someone else so I'm glad to say I've gotten to the other side of this it'll always be a work in progress I truly have just stopped looking at any numbers because they don't do anything for me. They don't add to my creativity. They don't bring me joy. And even if they do in the moment, there's that flip side. It's, it's just not worth it. Instead, I am measuring my success by the true, the true connection I have made with so many of you. Um, you can't put, you can't quantify that. And that is where I'm going to put my my energy and the rest will just be what it is. And the reality is when I stepped away for a bit, I felt the true whole, like I love sharing these things with you guys, whether it's books or knitting or climate or whatever that is, I love sharing it with you guys. It feels so genuine and I am so grateful to come, have come out of this without having to abandon the whole endeavor. Um, there was one comment in particular. It felt very much like the universe sending me a sign. It was an out of the blue comment on a very old video somebody had sent. Um, and it said, you know, I just found your podcast and I love it. And it's, I just really hope you keep doing this. She really, she said those words, like, you should keep going. I really hope you keep going or something like that. And it like brought tears to my eyes in that moment because it was like the universe brought me that sign of there is real connection, that it's not just a bunch of numbers. It is, um, there are truly people, you know, that I found that I've connected with and I needed that reminder. So that was a long rambling incoherent possibly explanation of the contents of my mind for the last month but perhaps you can now kind of see I've been absent I've this stew has been where I found myself right at the beginning of the MCAL too and I just I couldn't take any more um jostling of my very fragile heart at that moment so I've just you know I've kind of given myself permission to just take care of myself right now because I don't want to lose this platform because I can't handle it. Um, but such is life, you know, creative endeavors require vulnerability and there are times that you can manage it and there's times when it's harder to manage. But I'm gonna stop talking now because I feel like I am rambling. But that's okay. That's real too. That's part of the reality of this podcast. 
Um, let's move away from that real quick. I do want to tell you about this book that I just finished, and I know you've heard of it if you are interested in the reading world. It's called Wellness by Nathan Hill, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, I finished it two or so weeks ago, so it's kind of receded out of my mind, but I was struggling with what to read after Demon Copperhead because, um, that book was just perfection to me and wellness was Oprah's next book pick after Covenant of Water. And you know how much I love Oprah. She is a mig goddess. I love her, but wellness was her recommendation. So obviously I downloaded it instantly and I really was drawn to it because it was so diametrically different than what I'd been reading, like Covenant of Water was very, very different from Demon Copperhead. But this book was, again, very, very different. The struggle of the characters is just a world apart from what I'd been reading, so I was ready for that. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I do think it was another sign from the universe because as I was struggling with all this YouTube angst, there was like a long chapter in the book all about Facebook algorithms and how they manipulate um, Facebook users. Just, it is quite, quite unbelievable. And that chapter was like the one of the pieces in the puzzle of me coming to terms with having, like being on a social media platform with its own algorithm that just how much we don't know and how much we can't control and how manipulative so much of it is. Um, and that I was totally falling prey. I was personalizing this algorithm and falling prey to it, just like this character in the book. And it was definitely felt like the universe was like, honey, get it together. Like this is not like real life. Social media is not real life y'all. Um, so anyway, that was, that was just a side note, but I really very much enjoyed the book. However, the thing that kept it from being like demon copperhead level was the characters just, they don't have the same, the heart of the characters, the heart and soul is just not there. Like the... To me, what elevates a good book to like a great book is when the author somehow literally makes flesh and blood out of their character. And that is when fiction becomes art to me. And I am not a writer. I don't know what magic has to happen to make that happen, but there are, there are writers that can make that happen. This did not achieve that. I think the characters' struggles and childhoods and stuff were compelling, but they didn't rise to the level of like a soul connection with the character. Um, it is a very also written in a very, I feel like he's almost very self-conscious about his writing. Like there's a, all the sentences feel, they don't feel natural. They feel very highly, um, crafted. So the writing, you're aware of the writing. You're not in the story in a way that's like the writing disappears. Do you know what I'm saying? Like when you are immersed in a book, sometimes you don't even feel like you're reading writing. And this feels like you're, you're in the writing, the writing, you're aware of it. Um, so those are my thoughts on that book. Did I enjoy it? Absolutely. Is it like a must read? I don't think so. But if you are looking for an interesting, different book about uh, a couple and their journey from meeting through many decades of marriage and children and all that jazz in our modern world, it's set in Chicago. I think it is a pretty fun read. Um, what else? I don't think anything else. I am, um, we are thrilled that the Frasier reboot came out yesterday and um, my son has a later basketball practice on Thursday, one of the many days and 
while he was eating, we watched it and I found great joy. And it's like the ultimate comfort of life to see Frasier again. I don't care about the like, um, reviews from the New York Times that it's not this or that, please. The people that are criticizing the Frasier reboot don't understand what Frasier was, in my opinion. So I miss all the old characters, but it is so fun to see him and hear his voice again. So if you have not seen that, then you should check it out. I think I shall leave you here. I'm going to go ahead and apologize for the absolute, I feel like today I was coming to you after too long with just a swirl of stuff in my mind. And I just, I'm sitting here thinking like, I don't feel like I communicated any of it particularly eloquently, but such is life. I don't believe in editing here. So I just bring you the truth and this Chaotic time feels like maybe the words are a bit chaotic too. But anyway, before we go, I did want to read you this one poem because one of my favorite authors is James Clear. I don't know if any of you have read his work, but I love his weekly newsletter. And if you haven't checked it out, you really should. Um, and a lot of times he's got incredible quotes, but he had this poem in there and it felt like it just struck me so, so, so deeply given the state of what's happening that I talked about at the beginning of the pod. So I'm going to read you this poem real quick so that you end with eloquent words rather than my chaotic words. It's by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who, not, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I find peace in those words. I hope perhaps you do too. I hope to see you again very soon. Take good care of yourselves, everybody. See you soon.